And just like that, the flame seasons come to an end in the most flames way possible. Your Locked On Flames, your daily podcast on the Calgary Flames. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On Flames. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Jess Belmosto, joined by Nick Zeraris, and the Flames have officially been eliminated from playoff contention, and we're going to talk all about that. And just, you know, this post-game reaction, just the season ending in the most flames way possible, uh, it felt like a very Calgary 2022-23 game. There's nothing more flames possible than what you saw. They played very well. Mm -hmm. Their goalie made a boneheaded decision that resulted in a goal. He was great other than that. They peppered the other team's goalie. The two goals they scored were ugly that they really had to work for them. Those are all Daryl made a befuddling decision in player usage. That those are all your your bingo all the points on your bingo board for the 2022-2023 Saints. That's that that's a bingo. That's a bingo. That's four or five in a row, whatever it is. Everything you possibly could look for in a game from the Flames this season, you had. You had every little thing going. And it's weird because you would think a game like this, everything you got, whatever it takes, whatever. And it felt like they came out a little bit tentative, that mm -hmm. they didn't really have their feet under them. They weren't really going until the Stetcher goal. The Stetcher goal, they kind of settled into the game, kind of got a feel for it, knew kind of a little bit more about how they were going to need to play, how that specific game was going to develop. But until that point, very tentative, very clunky, very much the indecisive group that's mm -hmm. been here all year. And then after the Stetcher goal, everybody kind of, okay, we can do this. We're alive. Yeah. We're alive. We're, we get our feet moving. We're in the game. It changes a little bit, but it took them a little while to find themselves in this game and it didn't help. They were behind one, nothing pretty much pretty early on in the game. Yeah. I think, you know, there was very much a clear difference almost immediately after that goal. Um, and just I, I don't know what it was. I, you would, like you said, you would think that they would go out there and just give it everything that they got. Um, they've been playing and treating every game like a game seven. Tonight was effectively the real game seven. And, uh, you know, it's just, it was really just a culmination of the prior 80 games. Yeah. All in 60 plus minutes they gave us some extra for free. Yeah, no, if you've been in a coma for the previous 80 games and you only watched today's game, you got everything you needed to. You learned everything you need to about the play. This is, you could be 100 years from now and you could just go watch the YouTube highlights of this game and you wouldn't need to watch any other highlights or look at the record or anything else. This is the exact microcosm of the, the Flames this season, how they've been assembled, all of their high points, mm -hmm. what they're good at all of their low points, what they struggle with. You saw it in every single way tonight. I mean, it, it doesn't get more flames than the coach sending out somebody, uh, sending out Nick Ritchie third in, in the shootout. I I was I looked down at my phone and I was like, who is that? Like, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I like rubbed my eyes. I'm like, is that Cod? No, that's not. Cadre won already. Who is that? Because uh, like, and the minute... Co not Cody Glass. I, I forget who scored the goal for Nashville in the third round to get extended to the the sudden death round. But who Augustini, Augustino, whatever that kid's mm -hmm. name was, yeah. When he scored, I, I I I this is an exact recreation. I was sitting up like this at my desk watching and I went because you knew they weren't going to score again. No, you you could have sent out Prime Wayne Gretzky in a Flames jersey there, and he wasn't going to score. He was not going to get one past Soros, who was great tonight, like yeah. he's been for the last month and a half. And that's part of it, too. When you're playing a really good goalie, 
your margin for error is a lot smaller. I think that's probably at least a little bit why they kind of came out of the gate a little bit slow of like, oh, this guy's on a heater. He's probably a Vesna finalist. We got to do what we can here. And until they got the one past them, kind of that insurmountable obstacle of, well, if we can't get one past them, what's the point? And then they yeah. get one past them, the moment like in Rocky where, you know, he can bleed, that kind of thing. The, it takes a while to get these guys going. They've been a fragile group all year mentally in these games where if one thing goes wrong, it's been really hard for them to climb out of it. We've lamented the fact that they have, I think, one third period comeback all year and it happened last week. So th- there's a lot of there are a lot of clear benchmarks here to indicate that everything that has gone wrong for them this year has gone wrong. I mean, I I believe it was Saturday night. I want to say maybe it was Friday night. I forget where I was watching the game. And during the intermission, Elliot Friedman said something to the effect of, well, the flames, they just keep shooting themselves in the foot here. Yeah. That was Saturday night. Yeah. Yeah, You keep waiting for, they keep shooting themselves in the foot. Well, Elliot, if you keep shooting yourself in the foot over and over again, that's who you are. You're not a good team. No matter how good the team looks on paper and the talent of the guys who are on the team based on their track records, if they consistently are making mistakes, that's who they are. It, right. The track record doesn't matter when you're talking about the results that are impacting right now. Sure, right. you can say maybe they will be better next season, but that doesn't matter for right now. Exactly. It doesn't matter for right now. When every game is a game seven and you got to keep winning, getting points to stay alive, it, it doesn't matter if you're going to get positive regression next year. You're mm-hmm. talking about real changes now that are going to have to be considered at multiple levels of the organization. Yeah. And, you know, it's going to be an interesting off season. I mean, not as uh, tumultuous as last year's thing. God, because I don't know if I could do that again. But I just, when he sent out Nick Ritchie, I thought that they should just pluck Daryl Sutter from the bench right there. Go, go. The CTE was flaring up. Honestly, like, and I get it, you know, like, it's it's late, he's older, you know, it kind of gets a little, a little hard when you're older. And, but, like, Daryl, that's Nick Ritchie. You, that, that's who you sent out there. Not Lindholm, not Tifoli. Not anyone else. I would have been pretty far down the lineup card before I got to uh, Nick Ritchie to, to go in the shootout. Uh, I'll just be honest with you. Like, if I'm going down my lineup card, it would have been a little while before I would have chosen, you know, somebody who's been a marginal NHL player for most of their career, somebody who doesn't exactly have top six hands even. Like, we're not even talking about, like, uh, hey, like, if they sent, he sent out Lucic, at least I would have laughed. Right. Like, yeah. I could have felt, you know, maybe slight confidence. Not, not even slight much. confidence. I could have but felt, like, like, empathetic. I would have been like, oh, so Lucic is retiring after the game at right. the end of the week. I was like, oh, okay, you know, a little bit sentimental. But that, that's just, it's not, a, that's not explainable, no. explicable, whatever the word is. It's tired. I'm tired. It's late. <laughs> it is a fireable offense. That's yes. what it is. And coming up next, we're going to talk more about the just the implications of this game and how game 82 truly doesn't matter. And maybe we'll see some youth in the lineup. But first, I want to tell you about our friends at FanDuel. And don't worry, you won't have to lose any more money on the Flames this season. But you can place some bets on the MLB action that has kicked off. And with Grand Slams, no hitters, and double plays, they um, implemented the pitch clock. And games are going fast. That's pretty nice. And uh, right now, you can bet... um, with no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars um and if your first bet doesn't hit you're getting a bonus bet back even better and just go to fanduel.com slash locked on to sign up for your first bet and get up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets if you don't win um honestly you could probably bet on chris sales under for strikeouts and you'll win a few bucks um and don't miss your chance to Get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. And thank you everyone for hanging out with us, whether this is uh, your first time listening to us this season or if you've been hanging out here the whole time. Uh, Make sure you're subscribed and find us wherever you get your other favorite podcasts. 
I, I don't know. I don't know. That's how you can sum up the entire season. None of this makes sense when you look at it in a vacuum. When you only consider the talent, mm-hmm. the results, there, there's a clear desync here. They, they do not line up based on track records, based on all statistical evidence, and that tells you you, got, you had a few things compound all together. You had bad variance on your goaltending. Mm-hmm. You had shooting luck, regression in your shooting luck. Special teams were not as good as they were last year. Even though you were good at five on five, you didn't have the finishing. You didn't have the goaltending. You didn't have the special teams. It's great that you're good at five on five, but you can't be in the low twenties in the other. You can't. You can't be in the twenties in the other category. In the other categories, Uh, it's the. There are a couple. You can get by with really good goaltending and special teams. There's more than one team that's going to start in the playoffs next Monday or Tuesday, and with their entire. Their entire six, their entire path for success in the playoffs being rooted in their goaltending stealing them games. Mm-hmm. The Flames couldn't even get average goaltending for the most of the season. And again, you start think when you think about a, a season that's this long, it mm-hmm. feels weird to kind of point out individual games, and especially considering the Flames are probably going to finish four points out of the last playoff spot as opposed to two. If you're only two out and you go to the tiebreakers, then you can, you know, you kick yourself a little bit more in there, but you're talking about two, three, you, you have a specific ones that come to mind. You think about the loss to the Islanders back way back in the fall where they had a three goal lead in the third period. You think about that loss to Ottawa a few weeks ago. You think about that loss to the docks, the lot, the three losses to Chicago. Mm-hmm. I mean, you beat Chicago in regulation twice. You're in a playoff spot right now. And, Maybe you went on Thursday and you're in, but here we are. It's yeah. 1230 Eastern standard time. And the, the running the, the biggest question is who's going to be the coach and who's going to be yeah. the general manager that not the, how do they get the team better? It's who's going to be running the team next year. Mm-hmm. I am very uh, interested to see. I mean, obviously they're not going to make any uh, decisions now. And even if they yeah they say one thing, they can completely do another. I mean, last season, Don Sweeney was said to the media and to Bruce Cassidy, oh, yeah, like, you know, he's good. He's going to come back. Showed up at his house for lunch and fired him. Like, anything is possible. Like, you – there are just so many things that have to get better and so many puzzle pieces, and I don't know – if this off season is long enough for that to happen and for everything to get on the same page. So uh, based on what you just said, one of the points we should mention here is that these are people and people do not always act rationally. There are emotions involved and people will be sometimes make emotional decisions that aren't based on logic or evidence. No. They'll make it based on their gut feelings. What you just cited is one of them. Don Sweeney may have very well felt, okay, Bruce is going to be my coach next year. Mm -hmm. And then something changed in that process and said, okay, I need someone else. And they brought Jim Montgomery in. You could very well have something similar to that develop here where there's going to probably be an opportunity where they're going to ask Brad, do you want to try and work this out and come back? Or do you just want to walk away? Because if you want to walk away, we'll start working on that. Because I think you got to worry about the GM before you worry about the coach. Because the GM GM is in charge of the long-term vision, whereas the coach is more of the immediate if you don't have alignment between those two you're not going to be able to have organizational success so with that in mind you think about the big picture this season was missed opportunity after missed opportunity tonight's game is a good encapsulation of that you had good chances they played pretty well tonight after stetcher got them on the board they did a good job of peppering Soros. They had a few really good chances in the overtime, especially where I I, I jumped because, oh, I thought that puck went in the net. I, yeah. I, I was waiting for the red light to go off, and it just never did. And mm. I, it, it, it's a shame, and I don't want to dwell on this too long, but it's a shame a game like that ends in a shootout. I understand why they haven't gone to the 10-minute five-on-five, mm. but I do think that's where we were eventually going to be headed because I think that's something that the players are actually going to be able to agree on. There are very few things you can get the players association to agree on from top to bottom in terms of what the most important people in the union and the very bottom people in the union want. 
five on five for 10 minutes as opposed yeah. to a shootout. I think that's legitimately something we'll see within the next two or three years because there's, there's, there's vocal opposition and you know how much hockey players hate to give their opinions on anything. So oh, for yeah. them, for, for more than one person to point out and be like, Hey, we'd rather just play 10 minutes. And if nobody wins, it's a tie. I, yeah. I, it's a, it's a more equitable system and it's, it's frankly a better, it's more rewarding you should be incentivizing these teams to go for it. The Predators cycling out of the zone multiple times, burning 30-second increments off, it's mm-hmm. annoying. Yeah. It, it, it's it's infuriating because you know the flame, you, you're not going to forecheck after that because it's going to set up an odd man rush behind it. So it's it playing that style in the three-on-three defeats the purpose. I, I know I've seen people suggest that you shouldn't be able to exit the offensive zone with possession where if you want to change, that's one thing, but you should not be able to exit the zone, pass backwards out of the zone. You should always have to be advancing the puck to some mm-hmm. degree in the offensive zone. Maybe that's something you can revisit, but that, it's just frustrating that a game like that ends with a Nick Ritchie miss and then you go into the sudden death rounds of the shootout. Yeah, it's It's brutal. Um, I I really don't know how you can like end a season like that. Um, It doesn't feel like there's much integrity behind it. Uh, And, you know, if there's one thing we know about athletes is that they have egos. I mean, everyone has an ego. And I'm sorry if my season ended like that. Uh, The first thing I'm saying, I'm not blaming Nick Ritchie because I don't think he's tugging on Sutter's jacket saying, put me in, put me in. Like, no, I'm going to look at my coach and be like, what is wrong with you? Like, it's just, I don't, I don't care. You can trade me. You can send me to Arizona. At least it's warm there. You know what? I don't care. Trade me. I want nothing to do with it because that's just holy mismanagement. Hey, man, uh, I, I, I could tell you a lot of horror stories about being in high school and, you know, the teacher assigning the groups for a project and me looking around and being like, really, what did I do to hurt your feelings that yes. you gave me these people to work with? You that know, I'm actually going to do, you know, I'm going to actually do the work here and none of these people are going to do anything. Why would you do this to me? That yeah. That's effectively what it was tonight. Why yeah. would you, and it's putting a guy in a position to fail. And that's, what's frustrating about it is you're asking someone to do something they're not good at it's the biggest malfeasance we have in coaching today is guys asking uh, is coaches asking players to do stuff they're not good at harping on the stuff they're not good at Mm -hmm. as opposed to maximizing what they are good at these guys are extremely specialized now they only play the one sport and they work on the one skill they're really good at to get as far as they can and your job is to nurture that and to foster that along and to let them maximize it we spent an entire season lamenting well what's wrong with jonathan huberto why does he have half as many points as he did last year because he's playing in a fundamentally different system and without without another high-end player to complement his skill set it's one thing to be a great facilitator but if he doesn't have any finishers to play with there's nothing for him to facilitate yeah Simple as that, you know, I think that it's going to be one of those things where there's a lot of changes, um, probably off the ice, I would assume, first, before free agency and whatnot, I think that their first order of business should be addressing Brad Tree Living, yeah. um, and I think that he's done a fine job as a general manager, and that's a whole nother thing we could get into, but coming up next, we're just going to wrap up the show. And just maybe with some positivity, who knows? It's almost one o'clock in the morning and the Flames have destroyed any and all hopes of making the playoffs. And thank you everyone for hanging out with us today on Locked on Flames. Make sure you're following us on Twitter at Jess Bomosto and Nick Zararis. I was listening to the episode we did back in October. October of a primer i think we had i had this team finishing like second in the division that would have been an entirely fair estimate based on the preseason expectation the flames had like the seventh or eighth best eighth best cup odds of any team in the entire league coming into the season 
based mm-hmm. on how last year went, you replaced your two biggest losses with reasonable facsimiles. You felt the depth would be able to make up for that, mm-hmm. and it never came together. The goaltending is the obvious culprit you can point at. The power play never figured it out either. Those are your two biggest culprits for why this team that is littered with talent, that like I've said it over and over again, this is one of the best one through nines and, and the up front and one through fours in the entire league. There are a lot of teams where Noah Hannafin would be your number one defenseman who plays the most minutes of anyone on your team. On this team, he plays the third or fourth most minutes. That's a real luxury. Not a lot of teams have, but based on pre- based on the expectations we had two months ago when we did the will they or won't they make the playoffs episode, you figured eventually the puck would start hitting the goalie in the chest as opposed to going past them, and it never happened. Yeah, it and it's it's uh, it, over the course of an eighty-two game season to put all of the blame solely on the goaltending is unfair because goaltending is situational and it's really it's extremely reliant on what's going on around them. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't want to just blame Markstrom and Vladar, even though they definitely both had subpar seasons. I, right. If you Both your starters are under 900. That's unacceptable. You are an NHL team. League average goaltending is somewhere between 905 and 910, depending on the year. Sometimes it's a little bit higher. Sometimes it's a little bit lower. Offense is up, so goaltending numbers are going to get worse. That's just the mm-hmm. way the air is adjusting is going to work. So, okay, let's say you need 902, 903 goaltending. To be at 890, you're still 10 save percentage below where you really need to be, and neither of them was making key saves for long stretches. It, it's it's great Markstrom is going to finish the season on a reasonably okay note going into the summer. They'll reset him. Maybe they buy him out and they go with Vladar and Dustin Wolf. Maybe they run it back with Markstrom and Vladar again. They need to get them right because that'll be the, the single most important thing they do this summer in terms of the team itself. They need to get the goaltending mm-hmm. right or you're going to be riding the, co- the goalie coaster again. It's mm-hmm. fine to have all this talent, but if you don't have goaltending, night to night you're doing this over and over again That's and you fun. do not – and it's not. You don't know what you're going to get any given night. I mean – Markstrom played better the month of March and Mm -hmm. into April. He still shouldn't have conceded that first goal tonight. He needs to know that the minute he fumbles it the first time, he needs to get back in the net. He needs to get back in the net and let his defenseman play that. Or you just defer to the defenseman. I understand you're trying to get the puck moving, but when you are in that state he's been in all year where he's been fragile, he's been liable to let in the stinkers, that sinks you. That sinks you. It's frustrating because you know the talent is there, but he hasn't been able to unlock it all year. And it's really, it's it falls on finding the way to unlock the best that these guys have to offer. And that circles you back to the coach, the preparation, practice, Mm -hmm. mindset, all of the stuff you're doing away from the ice. When you don't meet your expectations, when your talent doesn't play up to its ability, you got to look at the culprits. Are they particularly an injured team? Yeah, they've missed Tanev for stretches here and there. They've missed Hannafin for stretches here and there. Missed Rasmus Anderson for a few weeks there when he got injured. But by and large, you've had most of your key players healthy all year. Yeah. So if injury is not a factor, then you start talking about, well, what's not working for them? Well, they're making the same mistakes over and over and over again, whether it be the goal tending the defenseman the power play that tells you there's something off in the preparation or in the execution either way that falls on the coaching because if they're not executing right it's on the coach to either adjust make adjustments and be like hey you're doing this wrong or b adjust what you're asking them to do so they can do it better because they've kind of thrown stuff at the wall all year and nothing's really stuck Mm -hmm. it's given this kind of directionless feeling where even though you know all they need is two games to go different three games to go differently over the course of 81 and they're probably in a playoff spot right now Mm -hmm. and winnipeg isn't it that's how it works it, it sports are inherently unfair. So if you're not doing everything you can to set yourself up for success, other teams are going to get lucky. The Jets haven't played well in a month and a half, but they're going to stumble no. into the, they're going to stumble into a playoff spot because the Flames 
the Flames ran out of games to mess up and Nashville sold at the deadline. There's a real argument that if Nashville doesn't sell at the deadline and they get this play out of UC Soros, they might have been able to pass Winnipeg. So it, it goes yeah. to show how much luck is involved and why you got to do everything you can to get the most out of what you got. Absolutely. And I think that um, they need to just, like you said, make, they need to make these changes because, you know, the players can only do so much. Yeah. And if they're not prepared and set up for success, then how do you expect them to go out there and compete at, you know, an except not even an exceptional level, an average to slightly above average um, spot. I just, I, the West is not anywhere near as competitive as the East. No. So the fact that it came down to this is absurd. I don't think we're seeing that. Uh, actually, no. Who Pittsburgh is waiting tonight, right? Pittsburgh Pit- and Florida? So Pittsburgh, the Islanders, and Florida are all still alive for those last two spots. They are all within two points of each other. One of those teams has one game left. The other two have two. It all depends how the next two days shake out. So there's still three teams alive in the West, but none of those teams is particularly good. You talk about two of them in Pittsburgh and Florida who have no gold ending to speak of, so Flames fans can empathize. And you think about the Islanders who are missing their best forward in Barzal. Uh, are rolling a bottom six that features guys like Hudson Fashing and Simon Nemec, excuse me, not Simon Nemec, Matthew Bolduke, and guys I frankly hadn't heard of since they were drafted. And they've managed to scrape together an okay second half. In spite of that, I'd be, they've missed Brock Nelson for extended periods of time. They've missed um, Adam Pellick for extended, they missed Adam Pellick for like two months because he had a wow. really bad concussion. They've stayed alive purely on their goaltending, which, like I mentioned in the first segment, you can get by if you only have a goalie. If you don't have any goaltending at all, you're fighting an extremely uphill battle. The week you were on vacation, I mm. remember I, I cited a stat that the Flames would, if the Flames were to have made the playoffs, they would have had the lowest save percentage of any starting goalie since 2007 or eight, something like that, of anyone to just make the playoffs, not let That's alone so do bad. anything. <laughs> It speaks to just how bad the goaltending was yeah. this year. I, it, it, it's really hard to be that bad as a goalie that on a team that's not, you know, one of the five worst. The Flames aren't one of. They're not Columbus. They're not San Jose. They're not Arizona. No. They're not an awful team. But to have goaltending this bad on a team this talented, it's really an interesting. Um, it's really an interesting way to explore the goaltending position and how we evaluate it. Because typically speaking, you see the inverse of this. You see Mm -hmm. the really mediocre goalie on a really good team getting protected by the team in front of them. And generally speaking, the flames have done a good job of limiting the work that Markstrom and Woodard have had to do, but because they haven't had it this year, even that minimal work hasn't been as challenging because I was reading something in The Athletic today and I'll wrap up with this because we're, we're up against the clock here. I was reading something in The Athletic today about just how you should eva- how you should think about evaluating the goalies for the Vesna because workload versus results and it's not as impressive if you're not having to work as hard even mm-hmm. if you might have better individual statistics with the argument being that because Olmark is playing on, you know, the best regular season team of all time, his workload isn't as challenging as Ilya Sorokin's, even though Olmark's going to have better wins, saves, goals yeah. against average. It's because Sorokin has to uh, shoulder Actually a more significant work. load, he has to shoulder a more significant load. That makes his work more valuable. It, it's the same thing as arguing Eric Carlson's 100 points on the Sharks versus Miro Heiskin in 70 points on the Stars. Mm-hmm. What's more valuable? What's be helping a team win more? So that's the way I would. I, that's the way I tend to think about goaltending. So 100%. the fact that even though the Flames haven't asked a ton of their goalies and they still haven't gotten even that. That goes to show you that there's something that needs to be realigned, reconfigured, whatever word you want to use. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? At least he didn't start 63 games this year. That's, yeah. you know, 
We can that might have been that might have cooked him. <laughs> that very well might have cooked him. Was playing him sixty three games last year. And he might never be the same. Yeah, he might yeah. never be the same. And there's no way to know. No, nope. and you know we'll just have to see what um, game eighty two holds. Hopefully, I mean it's meaningless, but um, at least we'll get to see Eric Carlson, I guess. Um, and thanks everyone for hanging out with us <laughs> through the flames tumultuous season that is effectively over and you know we'll still be here five days a week through the off season pretty much and um you can find us wherever you get your podcasts on spotify apple audible odyssey stitcher um youtube as well always encourage discussion there make sure you're leaving five star ratings and a nice little review uh helps us out a lot and you can follow us on twitter um they're on the screen. Thanks, Nick, for jumping on um, at of this ungodly hour and as my co-host. I don't sleep anyway. I don't sleep anyway. Who cares? That's why I knew I could count on you. <laughs>